Thank you, Bill, for remembering what service this is. <laughs> Appreciate that. <clears throat> we are studying a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church that he planted some years afterwards. This is uh, after he planted it. It's a city in the city of Philippi. He wrote it from prison. Uh, he has already shared in this letter his uh, great essence of his prayer for them, which is that they would grow in love. And he's also shared the essence of what he wants their prayer for him to be, which is to the, uh, that he might make Christ known, whatever that cost might be. Today, Paul begins a long center section in which he's going to exhort the church to be faithful in its calling. And a large repeating theme is going to be unity, unity in the way they treat each other, unity in the way they focus on Christ and so on. And he begins by urging unity around what the church is supposed to be doing. We're still in chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 27 and just four verses up to verse 30. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you're going through the same struggle you saw that I had, and now hear that I still have. This is a, a shorter passage, and so we can spend a little bit more time looking at the words as we kind of walk through it together. The, uh, the verb, conduct yourselves, in verse 27, that is a word which, uh, if you just found it uh, by itself, it, you know it would deal with citizenship. It, it's like saying, conduct yourselves uh, as good citizens. Excuse me. Where am I? Yeah, there we are. Conduct yourselves as good citizens. There's a reason why Paul used the idea of citizenship in this particular letter. Sometimes he'll use the idea of a body. Sometimes he'll use the idea of a family. Here he very specifically uses and develops the idea of citizenship. Philippi was founded by Philip of Macedon, whom those of you in history might realize was the, uh, the father of Alexander the Great. Philippi had a very deep and proud military history. In fact, there were some very important battles fought here not too long before uh, involving the transition of power from Julius Caesar. It was built on a spring-fed, fertile land, about eight miles from a bustling seaport, a great place to retire. Well, at least that's what Emperor Octavian thought. He took Philippi after the battles that were fought there, and he made it a Roman colony. More than that, he gave it what was called the Ius Italicum, the highest privilege he could give to a municipal, provincial uh, municipality. It, its citizens were actually Roman citizens. They could buy and sell property. They were exempt from the land tax. They were exempt from the poll tax. They were entitled to all the benefits of Roman law as if they lived in Rome itself because the emperor desired to use Philippi as a reward for, to faithful soldiers. He gave land in Philippi to veterans who served him well. Philippi was filled with military veterans to whom citizenship, citizenship in Rome, was a very, very precious concept. And I think this explains Paul's choice of words here and as he goes on. Conduct yourselves as good citizens of God's kingdom. And that was a charge that would resonate with these people. In fact, later in the, in the book, in chapter 3, Paul's going to make the very same point even more explicitly. We are citizens in the kingdom of God. Be good citizens. And this image introduces the point that Paul's about to make. And that is that just like good citizens of Rome, good citizens of God's kingdom must be ready to faithfully participate in any war effort as good soldiers. The core of the word that's uh, translated here, contending, in verse 27, well, it pictures, I guess, an athletic competition, athletic games. But you've got to understand that for the Romans, see, this word was a word for struggle, striving against uh, 
against uh, difficult odds, they wouldn't be thinking of Olympic-style games. They would be more likely thinking of gladiatorial-style games. Life and death, competition and striving and struggle, as in battle. And the verb that's used here has the, has the word with tacked onto it. So it's contending or fighting together. The best translation I found of all the ones I looked at is fighting side by side. That captures the idea very, very well. It's a verb that would remind military men of the Greek phalanx, a formation that expressed the very essence of unity in battle, where victory depended, as well as each soldier's individual welfare, on advancing side by side in an unbreakable column. This formation was actually associated with Philip of Macedon, uh, from whom Philippi got its name, and his amazing son Alexander, who used it and some other tactics to pretty much conquer the world. Fighting side by side, as one man, literally uh, in one soul or of one mind. It means fighting or striving together with a single common purpose. What is that purpose? What is the purpose for which all Christians are supposed to be united? Well, it's for the faith of the gospel. And that kind of phrase inherently has a couple meanings attached to it. It can mean two things. It can mean the definition of the gospel, the faith which is the gospel, fighting for what the gospel is, fighting to keep the gospel truly defined as Jesus Christ defined it. But it can also mean the communication of the gospel, making the true gospel known in the world, lifting it up, broadcasting it, sharing it, modeling it, making it understood. Now you put all that together, and Paul is telling these people that whether or not I'm released from prison and whether or not I get to see you again, conduct yourselves with distinction as good citizens of God's kingdom, fighting side by side with the one purpose of making the true gospel widely known. That's Glenn's translation anyway. In this letter to the Philippians, this is how the Apostle Paul describes the mission of the church. I'll paraphrase that here. We say that the mission of the church is to uh, discover in Christ the greatness of God and to share those discoveries with others. It's the same two ideas. Get the gospel right and share it uh, in the world. Paul continued a military theme by using a word that you would use to describe stampeding horses. He says, fight for the gospel without being sent into a panic, without being routed. And our unity of purpose will be a sign. It will be, it will be an evidence that uh, the battle ultimately is going to be ours. And of course, in any battle, there are going to be casualties. There are going to be wounds. But please know that being wounded in the service of King Jesus is a great privilege. Isn't it wonderful how, how much color there is in Paul's writing and how he, 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 do, he uh, creates it and crafts it very much to his... Uh, particular community he's writing to. But even if we're not in the military, we still get the point. There is a cacophony of contests and competitions and conflicts which clash around us every day. All kinds. Military, paramilitary, political conflicts, competition between businesses, competition within businesses, competition for grades, for college admission, for college scholarships, friction within families, a battle on many fronts to maintain our standard of living with increased demands and shrinking resources. And now here comes Paul. He's talking about another battle, a spiritual battle. Friends, don't be surprised if we are tempted to avoid taking this battle too seriously because, you know, it's spiritual. Somehow that word makes us think that it's not as real or weighty or as urgent as the other battles that I face. And there's a temptation, isn't there, that, you know, if I stay out of active service, well, there, there must be plenty of other Christians who are willing to volunteer. You know, whole versions of Christianity have been developed in which battling for the gospel is just not a priority. There's universalism. The belief that in the end, everyone is saved. Everyone gets to paradise. The only requirement to get to heaven is to die. 
And there are lots and lots of people in our society who believe that that is the Christian gospel. Not because it is biblical, but because it sounds nicer and it makes much fewer demands. There are many, many forms uh, of works salvation. Some variation on the theme that God grades on the curve. And nice people, good people, have nothing really to worry about. Certainly not the nice unchurched co-worker down the hall, or my nice unchurched neighbor, or my father. Some people may face divine judgment, but I can't imagine that any of these people, or maybe me for that matter, are going to be judged by God because we aren't that bad. And people who've never heard the gospel, those who believe other religions, well, surely they're going to be okay as long as they're sincere. There are lots of churches that believe something like this. You can tell that's true because of how few they send out in missions. Such ideas and others like them are ways in which different voices in the church have changed the gospel over time. Paul was in prison because he preached the gospel that Jesus gave him. He was faithful to the Lord who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Paul was in prison because he believed that everyone desperately needed to hear an accurate rendition of the gospel of Christ and see something of it in practice. A gospel that glorifies a wonderful God that takes seriously our moral failures and that offers grace without sacrificing justice. Not a version shaped and twisted so as to offend no one and demand nothing. Now, Paul would go out of his way to avoid intentionally offending anybody. He said, I would become all things to all people. But he would not change the message of Jesus Christ. And he would not stop making it known. So Paul was in prison. He was in prison because there is a battle going on. Spiritual, having to do with God, but very real. It is a battle for salvation before the day of judgment. Last week we spoke about Christ's weakness on the cross. Christ was all weakness to save us. But Jesus rose again. And those who believe in Jesus believe he rose as God's appointed king over a world that he is retaking for his father, retaking from Satan. One day he will retake land, but today he is retaking people, not by force, not by intimidating us, not by seducing us, not by using any of the world's tactics. Jesus recaptures people by calling the spiritually dead to life through the gospel message. The gospel message, the word of God, is the sword that he uses in his fight. The gospel given to the church, given to us, given to us to keep safe, given to us to keep unaltered, and given to us to make known to our world, to communicate it. When people receive the accurate gospel message, the Spirit of Christ can reveal to them their true selves, as well as the true and living God. Both discoveries are made in the person and work of Jesus Christ, along with the only way ever revealed in human history as to how we can be reconciled together with him. When we receive the true gospel, our identity changes. Now, we may feel different right away. We may not. We may be able to articulate what has changed. We may not. But in terms of our relationship with God, in terms of God's attitude toward us, in terms of our eternal future, we are different people. We are a new creation. Selfishness may still be the outfit we have on, but it no longer feels like it fits. It's not our style anymore. It no longer seems quite clean enough to wear as Christ's spirit grows on us, grows in us. And in time, the old lies we believed about God and the old lies we believed about what life is for begin to decompose and burn off. And from underneath those lies, a new person starts to break through. A person who's centered around God, the Creator. A person who is content with their hope. And a person who is devoted to caring for their fellow man. King Jesus is capturing people recapturing them all over the world, not to harm them, but to heal them, not to enslave them, but to set them free. This is the great battle of our age. 
And it's a battle as real as skirmishes in Afghanistan or the uprising of the Arab Spring or the tooth and claw of the stock market or the flashes of selfishness that destroy families. It's a battle just as real, but it is so very, very, very different because the goal of this battle is not to gain anything, not power, not oil, not a diploma, not a contract, not even an apology for ourselves. The goal of this battle is not to defeat anyone. If we win this battle, no one loses. We win our battle if we make the gospel, the true gospel, widely known. When that happens, Jesus' spirit has something to work with. He, lo he saves some by faith, and we call it salvation. That gospel can't be forced onto anybody, can't be forced into anybody. Faith can only come from within, can't be imposed from without. But hearing the true gospel, seeing it modeled, that's how Jesus recaptures people today as his spirit inspires faith from within. And 10,000 years from now, that's the only battle that's going to be remembered. Where is this battle being fought? Maintaining the gospel's integrity is a battle that is fought in the church right here and it's fought by the church in every generation within every generation of church people there are those who want to change the gospel every generation I'm talking about pastors I'm talking about church leaders I'm talking about Sunday school teachers I'm talking about millions of church members whom the world convinces that somehow the gospels wow, outmoded it's embarrassing it, maybe it's just too costly each generation thinks that's a whole new idea it's just a rehashing of the same heresies over and over again. I'm not just talking about large church movements, you understand. A large movement happens when a, a whole lot of small changes reach a tipping point. Small skirmishes over the gospel are being fought all the time in churches, all the time. The fight over gospel integrity is fought in the church. Paul fought it. Paul fought it when the gospel was only a few decades old. We read about that earlier in Philippians. He fought preachers who got most of it right, but who were seduced into changes which were subtly shifting the focus to themselves. It was still the gospel, but it was being dangerously altered, and he was worried about it. Elsewhere, Paul talks about fighting other preachers, Christian preachers, who had gutted the essence of the message entirely even if they kept the external trimmings. They had meddled with it so much that what they preached was no longer the gospel. You can find those themes all over the New Testament. The fight over gospel integrity is fought in the church every generation. Where's the battle being fought? The communication of the gospel, its public and private availability, that is fought outside the church. Outside the church. And that, too, is a battle fought in every generation and in every place because the true gospel is always a threat to whatever powers that be. The true gospel is always a threat to whatever powers that be. You see, the gospel lifts up Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord. He's a Savior from, well, some of the things which those in power want to maintain. He's a Lord who claims authority higher than anyone else's, higher than friends, higher than family, higher than employers, higher than teachers, higher than civil government. And you know the ironic thing is this. Obedience to Christ will make us better in every relationship. It'll make us better husbands and wives. It'll make us better citizens. It'll make us better employees. Make us better friends. Make us more helpful. Make us more loyal. But a Christian's loyalty in any human context is limited. Why? Because Jesus will always come first. It's not because we want to be difficult. It's because we believe that Jesus is God. Okay? Now, that belief does not have to be a problem, but the more controlling a worldly authority wants to be, the more of an inconvenience, and finally, the more of a threat Jesus becomes. And it doesn't matter what kind of ideology you're talking about. 
The more it wants to control, the more Jesus becomes a threat because he claims higher authority. So as a rule, the world will do whatever it can to limit the communication of the true gospel. False gospels it doesn't care about, but the true gospel it does. In much of the world today, as it has been in many, just throughout history, in much of the world today, the true gospel is illegal. And sharing it openly is punishable as a major offense, jail or worse. In what we call the free world, the true gospel is not illegal. But it is more and more being considered to be in very bad taste. And it's more and more difficult to share. I'm talking about resistance from the powers that be, whoever they are. The people who stand to lose the most if the gospel keeps saving people. You see them in the New Testament. In the New Testament, they're corrupt politicians. In the New Testament, they're scam artists. In the New Testament, there are businesses that pandered to various forms of idolatry. In the New Testament, that they're, they're the movers and the shakers of society who found real Christians less movable and less shakable. People who are furthest from power are the most likely to embrace the gospel. And there are millions and millions and millions of them, along with a few of the powerful who are saved quite in spite of themselves. With them, Jesus said, giving up power is as hard as leading a camel through the eye of a needle. But God can even do that. And he does. Praise his name. We are called to battle. A battle to keep the gospel true, to keep it accurate in the church, and make it known in our world. Our enemies, those who try to change the gospel, those who try to contain the gospel, they are not enemies we wish to harm. They are the people we want the gospel to reach. If we win our battle, if we keep the true gospel publicly and privately available, some of our enemies are going to become God's friends, and ours too. Christian, this is not somebody else's battle. It's ours. It is yours. What fronts are you fighting on? Where are your assignments? What, what are you and I doing to keep the gospel faithful and true right here at SBEP? Keeping it safe from all the pressures to change it. Rehearsing it to keep it fresh with each other. Keeping it fresh in our fellowship. Keeping it fresh beside the crib, beside the sickbed, beside the grave. Making sure that all of our leaders believe it with all their heart. Passing it on to every new generation of believers that Jesus captures and frees. What are you doing? to make the church stronger, better, more faithful. Christian, what are, you, what are you and I doing to make the true gospel available in our world? To make it the heritage of our own home? To make it a haven of love and hope where we work and where we live? And, of, and, and to see that the voice of the living God remains welcome or at least is allowed freedom in our society? No one can fight on every front. No one can take every position and assignment. That's why we got to be united in our purpose. That's why we got to fight side by side, each guarding, each broadcasting the gospel in our own unique way. Pastor, how can I find myself? What, what program should I, should I get involved with? You know, we... Had, Sometimes people ask me, sometimes they ask me several times in the course of their lifetime, how can I find my spiritual gifts? I don't know what my spiritual gifts are, and so on. I don't think it works that way. I think spiritual gifts are something you discover on the job. D discovering all those hows and, and making plans, that, that is, that's not the most important thing we need. We need that. We get to that. The most important thing we need is a desire to fight. Human beings are marvelously gifted in finding ways of accomplishing things. Solving problems comes naturally to us whenever we really want to do something. We'll find a way. We'll find what we do well. If we love somebody, we'll go into battle for them. We'll find a way to do it. Think of how much you fight 
to make the true gospel crystal clear to your kids. Think of all the things that you do. Nobody tells you when they're born what to do. You, you find ways because you love them. When we love somebody, we go to battle for them. And we find ways to do it. If you want to fight in Christ's battles, you've got to learn to love. That's why Paul talked about that at the beginning. That's why he's going to talk about it right after he gets finished talking about this section. You've got to learn to love Christians. Not just your Christian friends. You've got to learn to love Christians. Learn to love the older folks in this church who see things from a different perspective than you do. Learn to love the kids of this church, even if you don't have any kids or your kids are out of the nest. Learn to love the new members that come in and join us. These are the present and the future members of God's army tasked with guarding the gospel from those who would change it. And together it's our job to hold the line regardless of what comes at us to change the gospel into something more palatable to sinful tastes. And we'll work together if we love each other. If we care about each other, if we support each other, if it matters when we see somebody weak or falling down, that hurts the whole line. We've got to help them up, support, work. If you want to fight Christ's battle, learn to love everybody outside the church. Learn to love your estranged relatives. Learn to love your neighbors. Learn to love the people you work with. Learn to love a whole spread of fellow citizens, including those on the other side of issues. You can keep you can keep debating them and, and taking a different position, but you've got to love them. Learn to love people whose sins are obvious and ugly, as well as those whose sins are papered over and less visible. You will not do battle for people you do not love. And talking strategy is useless until we're ready to go out into the field. Then strategy becomes important. When you love people, you'll go to battle for them even if you have to battle their efforts to silence the gospel, you'll go to battle for them to make the gospel available, just as it was available to you. Christian, this is a battle in which you are called to serve, a fight in the church to keep hold of the true gospel, a fight in the world to make the gospel known. And every citizen of the kingdom who does not contribute makes the battle that much harder to win in our day. But you volunteer for duty. And you will soon find yourself in the thick of battle, maybe tired, maybe stunned and a little confused at times, maybe even bleeding a little. But I promise you this, at one point, sometime or another, at one point you're going to look up and you're going to realize that you are fighting right beside the powerful risen Jesus. He's right there. And he is capturing enemy after enemy after enemy and turning them into God's friends. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I, I don't know, maybe Paul would have used different images if he wrote to Severna Park instead of to a Roman colony of retired veterans. But we get the idea. Even those of us who aren't in the military get the idea. We know that this charge is still our charge. Preserving the gospel, making it known. That's our job. Oh, Lord God, what we lack most is not resources or ideas. What we lack most, Lord God, is love. Please help us love better, just like Paul's talking about throughout this whole letter. Please help us more like King Jesus. Love more like him. Then we'll be ready to fight by his side. Hear our prayers. Take our lives. We give them to you. We love you. For Jesus' sake, amen.